this lecture, we're going to begin chapter 3 of the book on sin and salvation. This lecture, we will look at sin and salvation according to Christianity, and then in the next one, we will look at sin and salvation according to Islam. Now, Sultan Muhammad Khan, who I think was a Pakistani a Muslim at the time, uh, pointed out that the lot of human beings is that uh, sin is second nature to us. And the question is, how are we going to escape accountability and punishment? He said, we need to look at this issue because the issue of salvation is the vital breath of any religion. Without it, a religion is not a religion. And this is so important because we all know we're only here on the earth for a short time. And yet both Christians and Muslims and most people, except for atheists, believe that there is a life after this one. We will all continue to exist in some form, somewhere. And most religions say there's either a good place or a bad place. And certainly both Christianity and Islam hold to that. So what does Christianity say about this? Um, first of all, let's take a look at the meaning of sin. Jesus said that he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he said, the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if we're to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strengths, to not do that, that's our obligation, that's a command. To not do that is sin. Um, and it's not surprising, therefore, that the Ten Commandments that God gave back in the book of Exodus, the very first commandment uh, was, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods except me. In other words, if you look at what is the essence of sin, or the sin behind the sin, uh, you might say it is idolatry. Because idolatry is have, having anything or anyone, putting anything or anyone over God. Um, and that's why the command against idolatry is the very first commandment. Um, as a matter of fact, Martin Luther pointed out that when we steal something, when we commit adultery, when we commit any of the other sins, we're committing those. We're, th we're thieves. We're idolaters. But we are also, uh, we are adulterers, but we are also committing idolatry. Why? Because when we do any other sin, at that moment, if I steal something, I am putting that thing over my love and obligation to God. If I commit adultery, I'm putting my physical pleasure over my love for and uh, obedience to God. So that makes me uh, an idolater as well as an adulterer or a thief. Um, and that's why in Psalm 51, uh, which relates to uh, David's sin with Bathsheba. In verse 4 he says, Against you and you alone have I sinned. Now obviously David sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Bathsheba's husband. He sinned against the nation who he was representing. But he realized at its core every sin is against God. Okay, That's fundamental and we need to recognize that. Every time we're sinning, we're sinning against God. What, what does Christianity in the Bible say was the origin of sin? Well, the origin of sin goes back to Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Because when God created Adam, he said, you can eat of, and he placed him in the garden, you can eat of every tree in the garden except one. Um, and, but if you, of that one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you eat of that, you will die. Um, but instead, of course, Adam and Eve, both, they saw the fruit, they listened to Satan, and they ate it. They were disobeying God, of course, because what they were doing was um, they were putting their own judgment, their own thoughts, their own desires over God. And again, that is sort of typical um, of all of our sins. You know, sin is not necessarily doing a bad thing, but sin, at essence, is putting a good thing and turning it into an ultimate thing. I mean, money is a good thing, but if that's what I'm living for, I'm putting it over God. Uh, you know, I, I spend all my time in my office, whatever it is, uh, you know, I'm sacrificing my family. You see, I'm putting a good thing 
success in the job, money, whatever, and I'm turning it into an ultimate thing. That's idolatry because I'm putting it over God. I hope you understand this. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, that is known as the fall, the fall of mankind into sin. And their sin did not just affect them. It affected everybody else. Because later on, I think it's in Genesis 4 or 5, uh, it said that uh, then Adam uh, and Eve, they begat a son in his own image. But now he's a sinner. And in some way, uh, Adam's sin was passed on down to his children. They passed it on down to their children, all the way down to us. We are born with a sinful propensity. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, and this is, by the way, what is known as the doctrine of original sin. Original sin does not refer necessarily, or is not limited to what Adam and Eve did, but the doctrine of original sin refers to the effect of Adam and Eve's sin on us. In other words, it changed them. They became sinners, and they have created us in their image. Thus, we are born with a sinful heart. Our natural bent, our natural propensity is to go our own way. And therefore, that's true of all of us. All of us, our worlds revolve around me. What I want, what I desire, what will make me happy, you know, where I get my security, uh, my uh, self-worth, all of these things. And that is why um, in uh, the book of Romans, Paul says, there's not one who does good. No, not one. No one seeks after God. Instead, we're all looking out for ourselves. You know, there's a saying, we're looking out for number one. Well, number one should be the Lord, but actually, in reality, number one is ourselves. Um, and so, we love ourselves more than we love God. Um, and so, everyone comes into the world tainted by the fall, tainted by original sin. Now, the corollary of this is that it is impossible for us to save ourselves. Because we all know that there's a fundamental problem in our own heart that we can't eradicate. Uh, and, you see, God knows this. And the Bible says that God cannot abide in the presence of sin. So, uh, we got a problem here. Most people think, and sort of the, the default mode of the human heart, uh, is that, well, if we do enough good deeds, then God will accept us. But wait a minute. Jesus said, I mean, and, and the Bible says, God cannot abide in the presence of sin. God's standard is perfection. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Because the only way we can be reconciled with God is to have no sin at all. No sinful thoughts, no sinful words, no sinful deeds, no sinful propensity in the heart. How do we get that? How do we get that? You know, this idea that we can earn our own salvation by doing good deeds, that is impossible. There's, I list in your book five reasons why. First, because God is morally perfect. That's the standard he holds us to. But once we sin once, we're no longer perfect. Therefore, we can't meet God's standard. Second, even our good deeds are tainted uh, with sin. Uh, because we, you know, for example, I remember several years ago I was in Kampala and I saw a beggar by the street corner and I thought, you know, poor guy, I should give him something. And so I gave him a thousand uh, Uganda shillings. Well, in part because compassion for a beggar. But another reason was I realized, hey, I'm a teacher of pastors and church leaders. If I don't give him anything and somebody sees me, what will they think of me? So part of my motivation was fear of what other people would think. Well, then when I gave him the thousand shillings, on the one hand, pride came up. Jonathan, what a good boy you are. You gave him a thousand shillings. But also guilt came up. You only gave him a thousand shillings. You could have given him two thousand or five thousand. You see, the same act came from partly a good motive, but partly a bad motive. And it caused both guilt and fear to come up. And that's true for everything. Because you think about it. 
if you think you can escape hell and get to heaven by doing enough good deeds, what are you doing? What's your motive for doing good deeds? It's because if I do enough good deeds, if I help this person and that person and that person, I'm storing up good deeds. Well, wait a minute. If that's true, even for part of my motive, I'm not doing the good deeds. I'm not helping that poor person to help him. I'm doing it to help myself. And if that's my motive, then it's a selfish motive. In other words, my motive has turned a good deed into a bad deed. And that's true for everything we do. There are no pure, purely good deeds. Third, it's impossible to know if you've ever done enough. We all know we should be praying more, we should be giving more, we should be more loving, more kind, more compassionate. We know we don't even meet our own standards, let alone God's. Fourth, no amount of good deeds will change our hearts, okay? They're always there. You know, you, you know, I, I shouldn't lust, I shouldn't lust, I shouldn't lust. And then you see a beautiful person of the other sex and something comes up in you because it's inside. The problem is in our heart, you see. And finally, ultimately, all sin is against God, as I say, because God's law is a reflection of himself. Um, and furthermore, to sin against other people actually is to sin against God. Why? Because every human being is made in the image of God. And how we treat God's image uh, shows what we really think of him. And therefore, we can't be saved by doing good deeds because all of our, you know, what I'm saying is, since every sin is against God, God is infinite. Therefore, our sin has infinite effects. It ripples out and is affecting this person and that person over time. We might not see the effects, and it's affecting God who is infinite. Our good deeds are only temporal and finite, and you cannot atone for infinite sin by temporal and finite means. Therefore, it's impossible for us to save ourselves. Um, so, what does Christianity say about that? That's where Jesus and the cross comes in. Only Christianity has a credible and coherent answer to this problem. Because we people are sinners, we owe God, because he created us, we owe God, and yet we can't pay it. Uh, we can't pay the cost. The only way that the cost can be paid is if God can pay it himself. But human beings ought to pay for it because God didn't sin. That's where Christianity is different than every other religion. That because that's why it is necessary. God chose to become a human being in order to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. And on the cross, yes, God upheld his law um, he inflicted pain. He inflicted punishment on someone else. Yes, but it was on Jesus. So actually, on the cross, he absorbed the pain and the punishment that we deserved. He absorbed it as a man. Um, so, there was a penalty to be paid, a penalty to be borne, and God bore it himself. Therefore, neither God's justice nor his mercy loses out. He did uphold his law. Every sin, every violation of the law was paid for by him on the cross. But that also shows his great love. He did for us what we could never do for ourselves. Why? Because he loves us. No other religion, certainly Islam, as we will see, no other religion has anything like this that upholds the dignity and love of God, the law of God, and his love at the same time. Um, so, you see, Christianity, unlike Islam, recognizes that forgiveness is costly. If um, you break something of mine, if I have a mobile phone and you break it, you owe me the cost of that mobile phone. Now, I can try and extract it from you, the money, but you might not have it. So, but if I say, I forgive you, what am I doing? The cost of that mobile phone doesn't just float off into the air. No, when I forgive you, I'm saying, I will bear the cost of your misdeed myself. And that's exactly what God did on the cross. And the depth of our sin, the amount of our sin, is shown in what it cost God. You see, 
the more you sin against somebody, the greater the cost. I mean, if I poke out your eye, no amount of pleading and crying and asking for forgiveness is going to give you back the sight in that eye. You know, even a million dollars won't. Look at what it cost God to forgive us our sin. It cost us the life of his very own son. Um, and so, again, Christianity alone recognizes this. And so when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What was he saying? He was showing two things. Number one, the essence of death and the essence of hell is separation from God. When he was saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Think about this. Jesus was fully God. He was one with the Father from all of eternity. And yet on the cross, he was separated. In other words, that shows he was enduring hell itself. And think about this. Hell, by definition, lasts forever. He was not just enduring one hell. He was enduring millions of eternities of, in hell for everyone whose sin he was bearing. And they were all compressed onto him in the hours he was on the cross. That is beyond my ability to comprehend. But that's exactly what happened. And secondly, when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was showing his obedience. He was showing his personal relationship. Even though he was bearing God's wrath and punishment, he was still my God. He was doing what we should have done. He obeyed God all the way to the end. And that's why we can trust him. Anyone who would do that for you and for me, I know I can trust him all the way to the end, even when I'm going through very hard times. And that leads us to the last aspect of this lecture, the implications of sin and salvation according to Christianity. I list a number of them in the book. In fact, I list six. Um, the first is, the doctrine of the fall gives uh, mankind uh, a, a coherent basis to fight against evil. Why? Because God created human beings good. But then we've fallen into sin, and that has affected all of nature and all of people, which means creation, the world, and people are not the way they should be now, okay? But we know what they should be like, and we know exactly what they should be like, because Jesus came to earth to show us what people should be like, and to make start making things right. That's why when he saw uh, sick people, he healed them. When he saw hungry people, he fed them. And he said, what I am doing is an example for you. We have a basis to fight against evil because we know that creation is fallen. Okay? Secondly, when we are united to Christ uh, by faith, we have assurance of our salvation. And that's why only Christianity gives it to us. Because if your salvation was dependent even in part on what you did, you know you could never do good enough. But our salvation is dependent 100% on what Jesus did, since he was fully God and fully man, and since he was tempted in all ways like us, but he never sinned, that means we know that we can have assurance of our salvation, because he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And when he rose from the dead, Again, that's why the resurrection is so important. It proves that God accepted his sacrifice. So, when you have doubts about your salvation, don't look to yourself, because you're a frail, weak person. Look to Jesus. He did it all for you. You can have assurance based upon him. Third, when we're united to Christ by faith, that changes our legal status. In other words, objectively speaking, what Jesus did on the cross liberates us from the power of sin, it propitiates God's wrath, it washes away our guilt and the stain of sin, and it reconciles us to God. And it achieves victory over deadly spiritual forces. Because on the cross, two things happened. Number one, your sin was imputed to Jesus. But number two, his righteousness was imputed 
to you. So that now, the Bible says we are in him and he is in us. So again, it's like uh, he has done for us more than just bear our sin. He's given you his righteousness. Uh, so that way, as a result, it, the Bible says that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. Fourth, being saved, united to Christ by faith, changes us on the inside. Jesus' example and his suffering on our behalf gives us a new moral power that transforms our attitudes, our motives, and our conduct. Because when you come to Christ, the Bible says, he gives us a new heart, a heart of flesh, not the heart of stone we were born, born with. He gives us, according to 1 Corinthians 2, the mind of Christ, and he gives us the spirit of Christ. This enables us to live a new Christ-centered life. Fifth, and going along with this, being saved and united to Christ gives us an intimate, personal relationship with God. Now we don't have to go through rituals and so on. We can approach the throne of grace directly in Christ, knowing that Christ is our great high priest. We can speak to him personally and individually, and we can know that we are saved because we have his spirit in us. And finally, being saved and united to Christ uh, gives us a new motive and means for living. This is very important. It's the essence of the gospel. Because most people think, well, if you believe and then you obey, you do good deeds, then God may save you. That's not what the gospel is at all. No. We rely 100% on what Christ did, not on what we did. When we believe, then we are accepted. Then we are saved. But that changes. Yes, are we supposed to uh, obey the law of God? Are we supposed to obey him? Of course we are. But we're not obeying him. We're not doing what we should be doing in order to gain God's acceptance or salvation. No, it's just the opposite. We obey, we do the things we should do because we already have been accepted. It's kind of like marriage. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that Jesus is the bridegroom and we are his bride. Now, I've been married... Uh, to my dear wife for 40 years. And you know, when you get into a love relationship, particularly when you're married, you know, when when I got married is that did I say, well, great. Now I've got her in the stable. I can do whatever I want. Not at all. It's because I love her because we're married. I naturally want to do the things that please her. Um this is not because of coercion or fear. It's because of love. And if you understand the gospel well, then you will realize he has done everything for me. He's changed my heart. He's changed my mind. He's changed uh, my spirit. He's, I've passed from death to life. He's done everything for me. He loves me. I can approach him without fear. I can approach him directly. I may not understand why I'm going through some of the things I'm going through, but I know he loves me, I know he has a plan, I know I am part of it, and since he's done all that for me, I know I can trust him. And because I love him, I want to show the whole world that I love him. No other religion changes the order of things like that. Every other religion is, you would better obey the law, and then maybe you'll be saved. Christianity alone says, you can't do that, and you know it but Jesus did it for you. And if you believe that, he will change you. And then naturally, out of gratitude and love for God and for others who are made in his image, you will start showing them that he is alive in you. Because we now have a living heart. We have a living faith. No other religion, including Islam, is like that. So Christianity, or sin and salvation, according to Christianity, forms a coherent whole. It all fits together. And it does perfect justice to God's law and to his love. And it gives a true picture of what people are like, that we are born with a sinful propensity. 
We can't do anything mm -hmm. about that. We can't change our own heart. God can do that, and he does that in the person of Jesus Christ. In the next lecture, we will look at what Islam has to say about uh, sin and salvation, and we'll see that it is considerably different.